Blog Talk Radio. I am your host, Yvonne Mason, and that song was written and performed by my nephew, Mark Stokes. He can be found all over the Internet. Please friend him and please listen to him. And if you are in the state of Georgia, up around Dahlonega and the area, he's always playing in some little uh, diner or pub up there. So check him out. He is one talented young man. Tonight is a special show because my guest works very late during the week, and he wanted so much to be on the show, and I wanted him to be on the show. So because of that, we are having a special Sunday show. Now, I have been out of town all weekend and just got back in today and was trying to throw everything together. And I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that because of y'all, that this show has almost reached 60,000 listeners just on the show itself. 
We are over 70,000 listeners worldwide with all of the podcasts. So thank you so, so much. It, this is not my show. This is your show. This is my guest show. This I am just a facilitator. This show belongs to each and every one of you, including my guest tonight, Arthur Grady P. Brown. And for that, I thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about Grady. He is a science fiction author who has been diagnosed with high-functioning autism. This man is very, very, very talented and unique, and I am so honored that he is here. And y'all know, ladies and gentlemen, how I feel about people who are unique because we are all unique in our own way. I love them because they teach me so much. Grady is a connoisseur of the science fiction, fantasy, and superhero genres. In addition, he is also an autism ambassador and hopes to demonstrate the potential benefits that one can gain from being autistic. And just from talking to Grady for the last five minutes, I'm going to tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, this young man is so intelligent so intellectual and know they're not the same that I want to learn more from him tonight. It's an honor. As a writer, Grady utilizes his autism to visualize the story taking place inside of his head like a movie. Also, he has a very strong memory, allowing him to store this information about his characters and stories in his brain as though it was a computer hard drive. Oh, to have that gift. His superhero series, The Young Guardians, is based on a childhood fantasy he shared with his best friends of becoming superheroes. Grady is also a passionate pit bull lover, and he owns two sweet and loving pit bulls named Wally and Fitch. Grady, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for agreeing to spend an hour with me. It's going to be fun. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. You are quite welcome. Now, as as we talked a little bit before the show, please um, tell our listening audience what brought you to writing, to wanting to write. Was it something that you always wanted to do? Was it something you fell into? Have you always had these movies in your head? Do you say that... Uh, you had childhood fantasies with your best friends, so I know you had a wonderful imagination with your friends. So how did you get here? Essentially, for as long as I could remember, I've always had stories to tell. When I was a toddler, until I was in middle school, my parents would supply me whole truckloads of yellow tablets in which I drew, told stories through pictures rather than words. I still have those tablets in my closet. Wow. It was not until... It's not until I was in sixth grade that I developed, decided to tell stories in words and then decided to become an, uh, an author. And during that time, I tinkered and experimented with the various genres until I found which ones best suited me. Why did you settle on the superhero fantasy genre? I don't know. Probably, probably because I like science fiction and the possibilities of the unknown, and most of all, uh, characters that are fighting evil and dedicating themselves to a cause greater than themselves. Now, before the show, ladies and gentlemen, this young man and I had a wonderful, wonderful conversation, and before the show, he had an interest that just absolutely blew me away. Would you like to tell the audience about your studies before you started going into writing full-time and what you garnered from that and how it has helped you write your science fiction books? Essentially, before I decided to become an author, when I was a kid, I always dreamed of being a paleontologist and study prehistory. But over time, I outgrew the phase and decided to incorporate some of the scientific expertise I acquired through my science fiction works. And you also started – You see, I can't even talk tonight. You also studied 
the fall of the empires and what brought on the dark ages, which is one of my favorite subjects to study. How did that come about and how did that affect you in your writing? Essentially, with my latest book, Newman the Slayer, I had to draw inspiration from medieval history as well as Dark Ages history in order to make it more realistic, believable, and authentic. And in my studies, I studied the Dark Ages, including what started it, which was the fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, interestingly, I discovered that my ancestors, the Vikings, even played a role in the Dark Ages. The Holy Roman Empire came so close to reinstating literacy and education and economic stability back into Europe until my Viking ancestors came along and ruined everything. <laughs> and how did they manage to do that? Because they were a, a bunch of bloody warriors for, for sure. Well, as they say in Game of Thrones, they were ironborn. They took what was theirs. So essentially, all of uh, Western and Central Europe uh, had more wealth and resources than uh, the Vikings had in their native Scandinavia. So they could not survive on their own natural resources. So they uh, made do with plundering and pillaging any uh, European kingdoms that were nearby. I never, I never thought of that. And you are absolutely right because they ran out of whatever few natural resources they had. Did they not? Yep. And what, and uh, the Scandinavia was a cold uh, frozen wasteland. And one thing you need to know is that hard places like Scandinavia always breed hard men. Very true, very, very true. In order to survive, they'd have to be hard. And their women were hard. Yeah, even their children were hard. You, so, see, ladies and gentlemen, not only do you get a history lesson when you come and listen to us and, and, and learn about people, you get the history lessons, you get who knows where we're going to wind up with this comp. We, but we will. Don't, now, don't go looking for his books yet because you got to just – Hang in there, and we're going to get to the books because the books are fascinating within themselves. I was reading something, Grady, that that you did an interview, or you were at an independent writers of Southern California meeting. You read a passage of your superhero novel, and the interviewer said you, when you read that passage, you incorporated all of the accents of every character in that passage. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun interview. Essentially, did, go ahead. How did you manage to keep all of the dialect and all of the accents straight apart and separate without messing? Because I would have messed it up. How in the world did you do that? When I was a kid, and even until now, I am very good at uh, impersonations and imitating accents and dialects. So what accents and dialects do your characters have in your book? Because they are, they are intergalactic, right? Are they, or are they Earth beings? You're breaking up. I can't hear you. I said, are are your characters intergalactic characters? Or are they just Earth beings? I saw, I still didn't catch you. Okay, what I'm asking is, are your are your characters from many different um, planets? Or are they just from Earth? They're uh, they're from Earth. Okay. Different uh, regions of Earth, the different countries. Like England and the southern United States, that, that sort of thing. Okay, gotcha. That would be difficult for me to keep all those accents straight. 
This is an amazing young man, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, he's amazing. Now, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, Grady, because I want you to dispel a myth that goes around about the what we call the bully breeds, like your pit bulls. In your bio, it says that they are sweet and loving. Would it be fair to say that, like humans, animals respond to positive and negative stimuli, and they react depending to them? Yeah, no, pit, uh, with pit bulls, it entirely depends on how you raise them. If you uh, give them plenty of love and affection, then they will be loyal to you until the day you die. In your research, and I ask this question because in in your studies, did you happen to run across the history about the fact that pit bulls used to be babysitters for the royal families and the high society people. They were literally the nannies for the children. Oh, yes. I tell people that all the time. And they are very loyal. They are extre- yes. And they will protect that baby. Yes, they will. If I have a nephew... Or niece, I I can trust my pit bulls with uh, with my niece and nephew. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Now, before we get into your books, seriously, tell tell our listening audience your background. You you graduated from high school in two thousand eight. Then you've gone on to college. You're getting your degree in what? I graduated from community college in 2015 with my uh, with my library science certificate, and now I am in Concordia University, uh, trying to get my English major and creative writing minor. This is going to be. Ex- the next bestseller, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, in the genre that he writes and whatever other genre this young man wants to write in, Grady P. Brown, I'm telling y'all, be watching for this young man because he is going to put out some of the best work out there. Along along the lines of um, Bradbury, I don't know if you've ever read him, but he wrote the Tarzan series. And he also wrote some of the sci-fi series years and years and years ago. Loved reading his books. And I see you doing that. Thank you. You are welcome. Now, just for a little while, just for a few minutes, I would like to talk about autism awareness and the fact that you are an autism ambassador. And... What does an ambassador for autism do? Essentially, I uh, promote the potential benefits one can gain from being autistic and to dispel the stereotype that it's uh, more of a curse than a blessing, when in reality it is more of a blessing than a curse. And I agree with you. Now, for those who don't understand what you and I agree on, Will you explain to our listening audience how it is such a blessing? Because uh, being autistic can give you lots of uh, advantages that you would have over other individuals. Like to take me, for example, I have a razor sharp memory and it's very difficult, if not impossible for me to forget stuff. And uh, when, and when you're, uh, given a task, you have laser focus. So you're like a well-oiled machine when given a certain task. And you stay focused on that task. You do not get distracted by other things that are going on around you. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah. When someone 
ask you about being autistic, and of course, they all they if they have this stereotypical mental attitude about it. How hard is it to retrain their thinking to the fact that this is indeed a gift? Because not only Grady, I would I would suffice to say that not only do you have a razor sharp memory and you can stay totally focused on task, but I would venture to say that you are highly intelligent with an IQ that's probably off the Richter scale. <laughs> Thank you. You are welcome. So in order for someone to understand that all they have to do is sit down and have a conversation, not just with you, but with anyone who is different. I have a brother that is, I'm going to go back 60 some odd years because this was the label he was given. He was labeled as retarded. And I tell folks, look, we're all retarded. I live in a right-handed world. But what happened is he got encephalitis, so it affected his speech, his coordination, his memory, his cognitive skills. But that doesn't mean that he's stupid and needs to be put into an institution because he's one of the smartest men I know. So how would you go about re giving someone the knowledge and the wisdom they need to understand that the word autism is just a word. It does not define who Grady P. Brown is. Essentially, like I'm showing you now, how articulate and sociable I am, which is which were advantages I did not have when I was younger, I'm basically demonstrating that it is possible for an autistic person to overcome the limitations they were given to begin with. Thank you. That was exactly what I was hoping that you would say. Our uniquenesses does not define who we are. It becomes a defining moment, but it does not define who we are. Grady P. Brown is a wonderful author, a wonderful human being, getting his bachelor's in fine arts and creative writing. I barely got through high school and then didn't go back to college till about 50 years later. So when we label people, ladies and gentlemen, we cheat ourselves of enjoying that person with who they are not what they may or may not have. Would that be a fair statement, Grady? Yeah, that would be fair. And I am so proud of you, and I am so honored that you're willing to talk about the stigmatism that comes with that label. We need to do away with labels. We just need to let people be people. Correct. And just put... And just pull the best out of them and watch them, wind them up and watch them go. Because when we label people, we cheat ourselves of a diamond in the rough and of being able to learn from someone else. Would that be a fair statement? Yes, it would be. Okay. So now that we have educated you, ladies and gentlemen... We are going to put the autism spectrum aside because Grady P. Brown is an author. Grady P. Brown is an up-and-coming author who has absolutely a wonderful memory and knows how to write a story, is getting his degree in fine arts and creative writing. So I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, watch for this young man because... He's going places. So let's talk about the Young Guardians. Why right. Why is it called the Young Guardians? Because uh, no, the young uh, no, part stands for the fact that the characters are teenagers, and the Guardians part, no, obviously, is because they're guardians of society. 
And why are they guardians of society? What created this desire for them to become guardians of society? Essentially out of a desire for redemption after one of them accidentally burns alive a bully with their own power. Uh Uh-oh. That could get... So that... So they presumed that they accidentally killed a, bull, a, a person. So they thought, thought that redemption, fighting crime would be a way of redemption. So these guardians have different powers and different names. And the first book is called The Young Guardians and the Genesis Spell. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Give me the premise of this book. Is this the beginning of their organization? Is this, were they just friends before this, and then they decided that they were going to redeem themselves? Yep, it is their origin story, and it revolves around them when they were mere mortals, just average uh, high school teenagers trying to find their way in the world. But then in, but by chance, they received their powers through a chance, through an encounter with an otherworldly being Mm. who was, who was the last of the high elves from another dimension. And how did they stumble upon this high elf? Essentially she fell from a portal in the sky and crash landed right in front of them as they were exiting a movie theater. (laughs) That could be shocking. Yeah. <laughs> now, are are all of these? D- did these young people? First of all, how many of them are there? In the first volume, there's uh, five of them, but with each consecutive story, their numbers grow. Do they just find each other, or stumble upon each other, or is it word of mouth that they come into this collective group to? Uh, save the world the in the first book they they've known each other since uh elementary school and they that friendship was friendship was kept alive when they took on their crusade in in doing the crusade would it be fair to say that there was conflict could is there conflict with, within the group itself? Is there learning each other? Is there growing? Is there trying to figure out how they want to get to where they want to go, as well as conflict on the outside? Yeah, because after they uh, escape from a high-tech uh, prison, they uh, end up as rookies uh, trying to figure out how their powers work and how they can use them to survive until they can find, find sanctuary and then start their crusade. So it's pretty much like teenagers today trying to figure out who they are, what they're going to do, and how they're going to get there. Right. And uh, also, they're trying to come to terms with the fact that their families were murdered by a mysterious individual. Oh, so you throw that little tidbit in there too, do you? Yep, because one thing, one inexplicable law in the superhero genre I've uncovered is that the most common motivation for a superhero is family tragedy. Good point. Batman brings that to mind. And Superman. Yeah, and Spider-Man. True. Very true. I forgot about Spider-Man. So would it be fair to say, Grady, that you drew these characters from... Um, being friends with your childhood friends and y'all pretending to be superheroes, so you brought it to life through a book? Exactly. Well done. And and again, ladies and gentlemen, Grady remembered all of this from the time he was a, a, a young tyke to now to bring it to life, it, like a movie. So it's going to read exceptionally well. You just published the second book. Well, 
I have three volumes of the Young Guardian series out already, including uh, one anthology collection and a collection of poems and uh, plays that I wrote. But a few weeks ago, I published my first fantasy book, Newman the Slayer. Let's talk about Newman the Slayer because you sent me that, and it my my antenna just went up because it sounded so exceptional. Tell me about Newman the Slayer. Essentially, it takes place in a fantasy world uh, uh, in an empire called Gradia that is divided up into nine uh, kingdoms and ruled by an emperor. And uh, in the kingdom of Umbran, a young man named uh, Newman Magnus uh, loses everything, his family, his castle, and uh, is left with nothing but the clothes on his back and the, his ancestral sword in his hand. So he has to uh, su- survive in the cold, dark wilderness while on a quest for vengeance. Now, is Newman the Slayer going to be a series as well? Yes, it is the first of uh, three books, which will revolve around an entire dynasty of kings and emperors. You are a better man than I am, my friend. I mean that with all of my heart. I can barely keep it together when I'm writing what I'm writing, but an entire dynasty? Yeah. All right. Then let's talk about that. Do you have a storyboard that you use, or do you write an outline, or do you just write? I just write. Everything is uh, saved and recorded in my brain for later use. I wish I could do that. I can barely remember what happened yesterday. (laughs) Yeah, the only downside of not forgetting anything is that it eventually gets crowded in there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it does. So you got to get it written down in a hurry. Now, you said that you have written poetry books as well? Yeah, while I was in Concordia University to get my creative writing minor, I took some poetry cla- and creative writing classes, and I learned how to do that. Have you got those in book forms where people can go and get them? On Kindle, yes. What is the name of your poetry books? It is The Writing Arsenal of a Common Man. Why that title? Because at the end of the day, that is what I am, a common man. (laughs) That is an amazing title. Okay. Thank you. Do the poems have a theme, a general theme that runs through them, or are they just poems that were stored in your computer brain and had to come out? They were stored in my brain and had to come out, and uh, they are not based on any particular theme. They're just poems that I write on the fly. So, ladies and gentlemen, not only does this young man write super sci-fi and now fantasy, he writes poetry. No, y'all cannot go and get it now. You've got to wait. Just got to wait a little while. They they, they want to go and get your books. They have to wait a while. I don't know right. what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> so when you write your novels, and, and as authors generally when we write, a bit of ourself goes into the book because it we can't help it. It, it. it just is. When you write and you're trying to, to get the storyline across, and, and with every novel, with every film, with every screenplay, he's also written screenplays, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the common theme is always conflict. There's, there's always a conflict of some kind. But what is is the message that subliminally comes through your books? Well, the one common theme that one common message that goes through is revenge. And so that, and so I try to use that in a morally ambiguous area. Interesting. 
because it's revenge of of people losing their families to evil and um, nefarious acts. Yep. Well done. I like that idea. But you Thank don't. You. It. I'm getting the impression that the, the the revenge does not come through in an evil and ugly way, but did they want to to as you say turn the world upside down and do it in the right way? Right, and in Newman the Slayer, you get to see Newman try to do that, but at the but at the end of his quest, you start to question whether if he is really good or evil. As a result of his quest. Oh, you are such an evil, evil person. So you let the audience decide whether he did right or wrong. Correct. Oh, even if listen. the villain in even if Go the ahead. villain in question is evil. Let it, not only does he write, he has a wicked sense of humor. I'm telling you, you're gonna love <laughs> this guy. <laughs> you have a very wicked sense of humor. Thank you. You are welcome. In in one of your interviews, you were asked what author had the most influence over you as a writer, and you gave your mentor. Yeah, Dr. Sherry L. Mainberg. How has and she helped she- you? Well, she helped uh, edit my uh, first two books and helped uh, helped refine my initially self-taught writing style. Is she also she is also an author? Yes, she is. How did you meet her? She's the mother-in-law of my mom's hairdresser. Wow. Yep. See, we meet people we need in the strangest places. I like that. Thank you. You are so welcome. Um the author there was another question that you were asked is is there a writer you would consider a mentor? And you said Christopher Polani, would that be the correct Paolini. one? Paolini. Paolini. The author yep. of Inheritance Cycle. Yeah, like Aragon. Tell me a little bit about why and why he impressed you so much. Essentially, he published his first book when he was 19 years old, and I was in middle school at the time. And uh, I was so impressed by him accomplishing such a feat at such an early age that I wanted to match my accomplishments with his own. Wow. I'm trying to find the right sentence, and when I asked my I just went brain stupid for a minute. Forgive me. It's been that kind of day, Grady. It, I, I have that propensity at night. Sometimes I just go somewhere. I don't know where I go. If, it's all right. <laughs> And and my audience knows this about me. They understand that sometimes Yvonne just loses it. It's one of those unique abilities I have. As an author and as someone who has not only published sci-fi and fantasy and poetry and screenplays, what would you tell someone that wanted to write but they were afraid to put it out there because they were afraid of rejection or afraid nobody would like it or afraid of this or afraid of that what would you tell them and why would you tell them what you would tell them essentially if you want to write something and be an author you have to have a hard skin and uh, as for fear, you know, it's just like they say in the Dune books, fear is the mind killer. Do not let it get to you. I like that. And you are absolutely right. There's an anagram for fear. It's called false evidence that appears real. 
Right. And I think as as human beings, we, for whatever reason, 99% of us are afraid of our own shadow. True. And we, and we want to be liked by the world so much, and we want whatever we do, whether it's write music, play an instrument, write books, give verbal readings, whatever we do, we want other people to like it. And like you say, if we don't, as as artists, develop a thick skin, that will eat us alive. Yes, it will. How... How did you develop that thick skin? Essentially through years of experience, you know, getting one bad review after another and then striving to do better next time. When you, I cannot imagine you getting a bad review. Who in the world would you give, who would give you a bad review? I can just tell without even reading your books, they're magnificent. They should be a <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, when you got your first bad review, this is for the benefit of you ladies and gentlemen who, A, have written, afraid to put it out there, B, want to write, but afraid that I I could wallpaper my wall with some of the reviews I got. When you got that first bad review, Grady, what was your first thought, your first instinct, your first impression when I got first got it many years ago, my heart mm-hmm. sank like a rock, and I even contempl- and I even considered uh, uh, quitting writing altogether. I noticed that my impulse to write just simply was too strong to give up, so I pushed on. Well, you know that some of the best authors in the world, and with traditional publishers, the the John the the James Pattersons, the R R Martins. The um, oh, I could name. I, I went brain stupid again. The Tim Dorseys, the James Swains, they've all gotten bad reviews as well. And what I have figured out is, it's not the book is bad. It's not the storyline is bad. It's it was not that person's cup of tea. Ah, okay. Because. Let's say, for instance, sci-fi is not normally my cup of tea. I, I, I used to read it years ago, but for whatever reason, I quit reading it. That doesn't mean that, that a sci-fi book is badly written. And for me to write a bad review saying it's a horrible book tells the world how ignorant and narrow-minded I am. Mm. Something to think about, wouldn't you say? Oh, yes. Much to think about. Be- I write part of my genres are true crime, and I've gotten both ends of the spectrums. Oh, I hated this book; it was worthless; it didn't read well. Got to got and then, and that's by someone who doesn't a understand true crime, b doesn't understand that true crime is not a fantasy; it's real life, and c that true crime is not pretty. But then on the other side of that, cops and people in law enforcement have read my true crimes. And have understood everything and have given it great reviews, well written, well articulated, told the story through the eyes of the the um the victim it's so it's it's not about us personally it's 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 on the reader mm, okay that makes sense perfect sense, thank you. you are welcome, so the next time you get a bad review. Think about it this. That person that read that book, A, didn't read with an open mind, and B, it probably wasn't their their cup of tea anyway. So why did they pick it up knowing they probably weren't going to like it, not because it wasn't well written, but because that's not what they read. It was foolish on their part. Now, that brings me back to my first point. When you read something, Grady, is as absorbent as your mind is and as intelligent as you are, do you try to read things with an open mind to get everything out of that that you can so that you can file it away and maybe use it later? Yes, I do. 
would it be fair to say that if we don't read with an open mind, that we not only cheat ourselves, but we cheat the person who's material, whether it's a newspaper or a journal or a, or a periodical or a book, we cheat that person because we haven't bothered to understand the completeness with which they wrote that particular piece. Yeah, because they put all their blood, sweat, and tears into that project, and they wound up uh, have their due. And would it also be fair to say that our interpretation as a reader might not be the interpretation of the writer, and neither interpretation is wrong. It's just the way that it is. Yes, it is. So see, ladies and gentlemen, when you read a book, when you read a periodic, when you read it, even when you watch a movie or a show on television, open your minds because I promise you, if you do that, you will learn something, even if it is fiction. Would that be fair to say, Grady? Yeah, there is all, even if it's fiction, there's always a little bit of truth in legends. That is very, very true. And and a prime example is King Arthur. There was truth in that legend. Yes, there was. So when you get the next time somebody gives you a review, a bad review, pay attention to not only what they're saying, but how they're saying it. Because I guarantee it's probably pretty snarky, and it is for lack of a better phrase, uneducated and that they refuse to read with an open mind. Yeah. With the first uh, bad review I got, I can see the, how that would work. See? So now your mind is at ease because I know you write great stuff. And if Thank I'd you. known you wrote poetry, I would have had you read one of your poems to us. I don't know if you've uh, got one. Cl- I don't know if you've got one close enough. That you could whip it out well, right I can, quick. I can uh, I can open one up right now, but uh, but until I pull it up, we can keep talking. Absolutely, you pull it up and we'll keep talking. So, what else have you got coming out? Well, now that Newman the Slayer is done, I'm now beginning work on its sequel, which will revolve will will revolve around Newman's children and, and when their will quest that- for the. Go ahead. When will that one be out? Well, I only just started, so it could be a year or two. I, it kind of varies from project to project. I understand that. Now, are the children on a quest to revenge Newman's death? That, and also to claim, uh, and also to overthrow the emperor and take the imperial throne. You're going to keep fantasy lovers and sci-fi lovers in books for years to come. I see it coming. Thank you. Now, when do you graduate from college? Uh, could be a few years from now. Because uh, some uh, college students uh, like to get uh, their classes done. Uh, very fast, but me, I like to take my sweet time. How many classes a quarter do you take? About two classes a quarter. That balances out my free time, my job at the library, and my writing. Wise man you are. A very you. wise you. man you are. Okay, I'm ready. So essentially, this is a folk song from Newman the Slayer called The Gold Phoenix Rises. Ox and stars stand with pride, for their shame they can never hide. Wounded by grief, the last phoenix flew, its flock all but through. With flames of vengeance, the phoenix soared. To his enemies below, he fiercely roared. One after another, the strongholds fell. For they had been sent to hell. Then the false god laughs with malice as he claims his prize. The skull, ox, and stars all meet their demise. 
They cry out for salvation but cannot escape their damnation. The gold phoenix rises through blood and fire, for all will feel his ire. All beasts of the north kneel to their new master out of fear of grim disaster. Wow. You gave me chill bumps. Sorry. No, that's a good thing. Okay, thank you. That, oh my goodness, yes, I have to go in order now. Now I got to go download your poetry. No, ladies and gentlemen, you can't go yet. You have to wait just like I have to wait till the end of the show. And speaking of the end of the show, our hour is almost over. Oh, dang. (laughs) It goes by fast, very fast. Yeah, that's why. Absolutely. That's why I asked you when you thought you might have the new book done because I want to bring you back, Grady. You are an, you are an interesting, interesting guest, and I have enjoyed you so much. I've learned a lot. Thank you, and you're welcome. And and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you've been at ease and enjoyed every minute of it because you are an amazing young man, and you're going to go far. Thank you. That means a lot coming from you. Thank you, darling. I am honored. Now, will you do me a favor? Yes. Will you tell Will you tell these lovely people where you can be found, where your books can be found, and the name of your books? I can be found on Amazon.com, and the names of my books are as follows. The Young Guardians and the Revelation Orb, Newman the Slayer, The Young Guardians and the Genesis Spell, The Young Guardians and the Great Darkness, The Young Guardians Chronicles Compendium 1, and The Writing Arsenal of a Common Man, Volume 1. And are there going to be more poems going up? Yes, there will be, but uh, brainstorming these things sometimes take time. I know how well poetry is not my strong um, arc, but I I love writing it when it hits me, but it's not something that I do well at all. You, my friend, have mastered it. Thank you. Now, they can also find you on uh, Facebook, correct? Yes, there is. I have two Facebook pages instead of just one. There is, hold on, I'm loading them. There's Grady P. Brown's Fantasy Books. You'll see the dragon from Newman the Slayer on its uh, logo. And the other one is The Young Guardians. And I can also be found on WordPress.com and Goodreads.com as well. Under Grady P. Brown? Yep. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. No, you cannot go now because we are not done yet. We aren't done. You can't go yet. You have to wait. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very, very special show for a, a very, very special young man who I am honored and proud to say, though I've never met him, I consider him friend. Thank you. Because... You are welcome because this young man is so talented and so gifted and he bears my watching to see how he grows and becomes part of my future. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, my future, our future. His contribution to our society is priceless. His works are going to be read for for years and years and years to come. And you know, all of you who follow this show know that I believe in our future. Because without our young people, we have no future. And I, I am a supporter of our young people and their dreams and helping them make them real and succeed. So I want all of you to go tell your friends, tell your relatives, tell your enemies. I don't care. To, to look up this young man and to buy his work. Because if you don't, one of these days, he's going to become so famous 
that his work is going to be so expensive, you're going to say, I wish I had. And that's all I'm going to say about that, as Forrest Gump says. So it is the end it is the end of our show. And Grady, I want you to just when the show goes off, just stay on for a few minutes because I've got some things to tell you. But at the end of the show, y'all all know that I say a few words of, of wisdom. And one of them is don't just feel special, be special. Because when you are special, that is when you grab the world by its horns. And you succeed. And the difference between who you are and who you want to be is what you do. Now think about that. The difference between who you are and who you want to be is what you do. So who you are today and who you want to be tomorrow is what you do in between. One day, you'll just be a memory for some people. But do your best to be a good one. And then the last one is your smile is your logo. Your personality is your business card. And how you leave others feeling after having had an experience with you, ladies and gentlemen, that does become your trademark. Grady, would that be a fair statement? Very fair statement because you'll never become who you want to be by doing nothing. You are exactly right. And ladies and gentlemen, if you want to achieve greatness, please, please, please stop asking permission. Because if you ask permission, it will never happen. That also is a true statement. It's just like what Robin Williams said in the Dead Poets Society, seize the day. Absolutely. Because today is all we have. We're not promised tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. So seize this day. Make this day count. Be who you want to be by doing what you do. Now... We start our week again on Wednesday night, and we go Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. The lineup this week is over the top, and I want to thank Grady for being on the show tonight from the bottom of my heart. He is an amazing guest, an amazing young man, and ladies and gentlemen, not only have you learned about what a wonderful talent he has and how gifted he is. But I hope that when you see someone who is different and unique, that you embrace the uniqueness. Would that be fair, Grady? Yes, it would be. Just embrace it because I'm going to tell you, you will learn much more from them than, than they will ever learn from you because we're all unique. We all have something about us that is different. But we all have a purpose, and Grady's purpose is to be a wordsmith of the ages. So I want to thank you, Grady, for being on the show tonight and for spending an hour with me, and I would like to bring you back sometime next year and do this again, if you're willing, and see how far along you, and see how far along you are on your new works. And and, right. and just catch up and just catch up with you. See where you are. See what you're doing. See how you're getting there. Thank you. You're welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Yvonne Mason, and we are off the chain with my guest and my new friend, author Grady P. Brown. You are now free to roam about the country and go and get his books and read them and share them and look him up, friend him on Facebook. So until Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, this is Yvonne Mason with Grady Brown, and we are definitely always off the chain. So until then, we say good night. Thank you.
Okay, we're off the air now. So what's going to happen is when we hang up, the show will upload into the archives. When it uploads, I'm going to put it, the link up on my page, and I'm going to tag you. I want you to take this show and spread it around all over your pages and use it to advertise you and your work. Then tomorrow, uh, tomorrow I will put it up on SoundCloud, MixCloud, Spreaker, um, Podcast Garden, and Podcast.com. I will send. I will also put those links up on my page and tag you in them. This is my gift to you, my friend. You take these links and share them with everybody you know and let people know that you were on the radio and that this show is heard all over the world. This show is also heard on YouTube, TuneIn Radio, FM.com, and iTunes. All righty. And thank you again. Anytime. All right. Until we talk again... I'm going to go get your poetry. Thank you. All right, sweetheart. Talk to you later. All right, Eddie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Amazing young man.